Andrew's here with us from Paper Profits. He is a note investor, he's an author, and he was actually a guest speaker at our recent QuestCon Live online conference as well. So before we get started, I do just have a couple of quick announcements for you guys, kind of as we let people get signed on here. For those of you guys who do not know me, my name is Haley Gant. I am one of our IRA specialists here at Quest, and I work in our marketing department here with several of our other marketing ladies and IRA specialists to help to put on all of these events for you guys. So if you're watching today's class, Today's class, as well as all of our other classes, are recorded. You can re-watch them on our YouTube at any time. But I do want to take just a couple of minutes and go through you know, who we are at Quest, how we can help you, and some of our upcoming events and promotions that we currently have going on. Now, Quest Trust Company is a self-directed IRA custodian. We're based out of Houston, Texas, but we do have clients all across the U.S. So our clients use their IRAs to invest into non-traditional assets. So things like real estate, promissory notes, and private placement investments. You can actually hold all of these types of investments in an IRA, but the only problem is, is most traditional custodians like Fidelity, Charles Schwab, their processes are only set up to allow you to hold publicly traded assets. So at Quest, we more so specialize in holding privately held assets. So as you can see here, we're a pretty decent sized company, kind of homegrown from the state of Texas. We've got about 20,000 clients nationwide, and we have about $2 billion in assets under management. Now, all of that $2 billion in assets under management is privately held assets that our clients choose to hold in their IRAs here at Quest. And not only do you have the ability to invest in two different types of assets, but at Quest, we are very passionate about teaching about all of these different investment types, the different ways that you can diversify your retirement portfolio. And we really like bringing in different guest speakers from pretty much all across the U.S. to educate about different types of investments and kind of help you guys get more educational resources as well as you are learning how to self-direct your IRA. Now, the most important bullet point on this slide here is our disclaimer. So at Quest, it's really important. We provide a lot of education, but we do not provide tax, legal, or investment advice. Please always do your own due diligence before you enter into investments. Do not rush into deals with individuals and make sure that you're taking the time to do things properly. Now, that being said, even though we cannot give you tax, legal, or investment advice, if you have not had a one-on-one -on -one consultation with one of our IRA specialists and you have questions about how this process works, definitely don't hesitate to reach out to us. I'll have our contact information here at the end of these slides. We're always happy to help answer questions for you guys. And if it does fall under something that, you know, is a little bit more on the advice side that we can't offer, you know, we'll kind of help to point you in the right direction and certainly answer any questions that we have for you guys. Now, I'm going to kind of skip over these slides here. I will let you all know this is really where the free consultation with one of our IRA specialists is so important because we are actually trained to ask you certain questions like, do you have a 401k to roll over? Do you have a Roth IRA? Are you self-employed? Or maybe do you have a health savings account or children with educational expenses? All seven of these types of accounts that you see on the screen here can be self-directed in exactly the same way where you can invest these accounts into real estate, notes, and other types of privately held assets. Now, today we are really going to focus in here on the promissory notes. So on the screen here, this is just a few of the many different investment options that you have with your IRA at Quest. Notice that stocks, mutual funds, CDs, other publicly traded securities are not listed on the screen. So at Quest, you know, we really like to teach people how to just think a little bit differently about the types of assets that you can actually invest in. And what's really cool is if you are a real estate investor or if you're in the real estate field, a lot of us that are real estate investors have our own niches. We have our own areas of expertise. So you can actually apply this knowledge and skill set that you have to your IRA investments. And in turn, that grows completely tax deferred or tax free. 
So a lot of great resources here. It's pretty easy to get it started, get the account funded, and then we'll help you, you know, kind of with the next steps as well once you're figuring out, you know, what you need to submit to Quest to invest those funds. But really, again, it just comes down to taking the first step to schedule a consultation with one of our IRA specialists, and we'll walk you through all of these five steps and make it really easy for you. Now, with my last few minutes that I have here in this introduction, I do want to walk you guys through just a few of the educational resources that we offer, as well as some of our upcoming events as well. So as you can see here, it looks like there's a lot on this screen, but we have a lot of resources. Most of them are free. I would definitely encourage you guys to check out our YouTube channel. It has all of our classes that we've hosted over the last several months. Those are all archived on our YouTube channel, including today's class. And we have shorter pre-recorded videos as well over different various IRA topics, anything from Roth IRAs, Roth conversions, solo 401ks, you name it, we probably have a YouTube video about it. So I definitely encourage you guys to go check that out. And this Wednesday, actually tomorrow, um, we have our virtual networking happy hour. This is probably my personal favorite event that we host. It is on the first and third Wednesday of every month, which is tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. And this is basically set up as a Zoom meeting. So everyone who's online gets to share their cameras. Um, everyone gets a chance to introduce themselves to the group. And these events have really taken off since we started hosting them last August. At every single happy hour, we have anywhere from 50 to 70 investors from across the US. Everyone gets about a minute to introduce themselves to the group. And then we kind of open it up for conversations at the end. So whether you're a new investor, if you're looking for deals, if you're looking to maybe invest your money somewhere, um, there's definitely lots of great connections to be made here. Again, always do your own due diligence, but this event has been really fun to host and it's created a really nice little ecosystem of investors and IRA investors here as well. We also, our next big event that we will be hosting is our Quest Summer Intensive. It's actually a three-day event, three Fridays in a row, where we will be doing a high-level deep dive into uh, private placement investments one day, real estate investments another day, and note investments on the third day. Um, so that'll be July 16th, 23rd, and 30th. You can pick and choose which days you want to event, uh, attend. You can attend all th three if you want to, or any ticket purchase, you will get the recordings of the event as well. So just to kind of wrap it up, keep in mind, you do have until May 17th to get your 2020 contributions in. Um, the tax filing deadline was extended to May 17th for the entire U.S. And if you're in Texas or if you've been affected by the winter storms, um, you do have just a little bit longer until June 15th. So don't underestimate the power of making your annual contributions it's all about planting the seeds today and investing that money and learning how you can grow it over the next 5, 10, maybe even 20 to 30 years. So make sure to get that done before May 17th. And if you open your IRA before the end of this month, um, we will give you a $125 credit to your account. That will cover your first transaction fee here at Quest. And I can see here that we have the chat kind of lighting up here. I'm not reading it right now, but I will let you guys know that I do have Juan Deshawn, one of our top IRA specialists here in Houston. He is online with me moderating today's webinar. He's been with Quest for almost as long as I have, almost five years. And Juan is a great point of contact if you are looking to learn how self-directed IRAs work or looking to set up an account or maybe even just looking to set up your first consultation just to kind of get a feel for how it all works. So Juan, be sure to put your email there in the chat so people can reach out to you. But we are very easy to get a hold of here at Quest. It's something we really pride ourselves on. You can chat live with an IRA specialist at any time during our business hours, during our website. And guys, that is actually us on the chat. Um, we kind of rotate. We have different days of the week that we're all assigned. And it is our certified IRA specialists that are on that chat every day of the week. Or you can give us a call, send us an email, or just reach out to Juan here in the chat. And he can definitely connect you with any resources that you need or a free consultation to help you get started. So 
Without further ado, I would like to go ahead and bring on today's speaker, Josh Andrews from Paper Profits. Um, Josh has a great presentation planned for you guys um, over all of the basics, the foundations that you should know when it comes to note investing. He's also got a great book out there that I believe Quincy, our founder, has contributed to. So um, Josh, it, Josh, it's great to have you here today. If you have questions, be sure to put them in the Q&A box and we'll come back on at the end and get all of them answered. Josh, I'm excited to see your presentation. Go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Haley. And thanks for having me here today. Yeah. Um, is my screen shared? Uh, not yet. You'll have to reshare it. Okay, let's do that. I kicked it out when I shared mine. Yeah. Okay, can you see it? Perfect. You're good to go. All right. So first off, what I wanted to do was I wanted to say thank you for having me on today. And many of you listening may have seen some of my other presentations where we do talk about notes. And one thing I wanted to mention is I don't know where a lot of people are starting from. And so usually what I try to do is do kind of a 30,000 foot view and then zoom in on some details. So the first few uh, parts of this presentation is gonna be over some basic items, what a note is, how they function, et cetera, which you may have seen before. So what I would say is just hang in there with me if you have seen that. Later on in the presentation, I have completely new material that I think will be of value to you. So uh, without getting into too much detail, let's uh, just talk about the disclosures really quickly. We're not selling anything. Uh, we're not making any kind of claims that you can or can't uh, make any type of money with this type of investment. This is just for educational purposes only. And just a short blurb about me, I grew up in a rural kind of town, very small town in northern Idaho. That's actually a picture of the lake where we used to live. Uh, I'm the oldest of three boys. I have two younger brothers. I currently live in Austin, Texas, and I've been here for just over six years. And this is home. This is, this is where I'm going to settle. Uh, I've been very passionate about financial freedom. It's something that's been important to me ever since I was young. And I've been investing in mortgage notes with my own money since 2012. So I originally started with my own money with actually IRA money and kind of learned from there and then grew, grew the business up a little bit. So I, I read a lot. I'm a student of banking, economics, finance. Uh, all of those things I think are very important to us in our daily lives. So it's something that I enjoy keeping up on. And currently my day-to-day -day is managing two investment funds, which myself and my partner, Jane Wabs, uh, who is on this, on this presentation as well, uh, manage for our investors. So that's my day-to-day. -day. Uh, this is us, the principals. So that's me on the left. And this is my partner, Jane, on the right. And uh, our company is called Paper Profits. It's after my book, which I'll give you an offer um, just to ship it to you for free if you like. It's just educational content at the end of this presentation. Um, so just a quick recap on why financial freedom is important, at least what it means to me. And I think we should all have some sort of reasoning behind that, some sort of why. For me, it really just boils down to, you know, having the freedom to be able to do what I want, when I want, with who I want. And that's really the key. Um, one, of, one of the things that drove that home to me was, uh, there's a picture on the left here. My parents live in the mountains, so in, in Idaho, and they own a piece of property where there's a stream running through it. And about 30 years ago or so, when I was a child, my dad took a picture of us, me and him, sitting next to the stream. And I went up to visit them recently, well, recently, probably a couple years ago actually now, and he showed me this picture and he said, this is my favorite picture of us together. And I, I didn't think much more of it, but then when we left, when I was leaving, um, we took another picture. I had my mom take a picture of my dad and I, who's obviously much older now, next to that same stream. And I kept that because it means something to me. It means that our time is limited. Our, uh, our ability to do what we want with who we want is limited. And to me, financial freedom, having passive cash flow, building up wealth, that's the reason to do it for me. It's not for you know expensive cars or other stuff. Uh, it's really just to have that freedom of time and freedom of choice. So I think it's important to kind of narrow that down why you're doing certain things. It helps provide an impetus. 
so let's talk about notes and mortgages. So essentially notes and mortgages uh, are referencing kind of the same thing. A mortgage, well, a note first off is really just an IOU. It's a promissory note that spells out the terms or an agreement of a loan. So the repayment schedule, uh, the interest rate, uh, you know, when the maturity date is, when the funds are totally due back to the lender. So it's really, you can think of this as just a promise to pay. The mortgage or a deed of trust, depending on the state, is a document that is recorded at the county that is usually securing a lien against real estate. So it could be single family, residential, could be all kinds of things. But really what it does is it protects the lender if the borrower defaults on their note promise, their promissory note. So it gives very specific actionable items that the lender can take if they need to, uh, to recover their funds or make efforts to recapture their capital. So the note and mortgage are two separate documents, but they kind of go hand in hand with if you're purchasing a note or mortgage, those terms are kind of used interchangeably. If you say you bought a note, well, you bought really the note and the mortgage, you bought them together. And just like real estate, there is different types of notes uh, and mortgages. So some of these here, um, you know, a first lien is really just uh, a mortgage that was recorded on a piece of property first in time. If there's one recorded two years later, that's a second lien. If there's one recorded three years after that, that's a third lien. And so the priority matters when um, in certain foreclosure situations. And then also if uh, you go to refinance or you go to pay off the home or you go to sell it, who gets paid first in that order is really important. So that's really the difference between lien position. Uh, performing means paying is agreed. So paying is agreed is what we all hope to have uh, all of our borrowers do, but really it's just a mortgage that is paying to the terms of the note. Uh, they're not defaulted. They're not skipping payments. Non-performing means that they're not paying. And typically non-performing is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 to 120 days or more late. So you can be delinquent where maybe you make a payment every 60 days or so, that's really delinquent. That's not non-performing. Uh, non-performing is really where this borrower is kind of falling off the horse and they need some help. Reperforming simply means that it was non-performing and now for some reason it's back on the horse. They're making payments, they've resumed normal payments, there's nothing extra owed. Um, a lot of times reperforming loans, if they've been modified or if the borrowers put a large down payment, they can be very profitable. So they're not necessarily, um, I don't want you to think of those as shaky loans. They can be, but it really depends on how much equity is in the home, how much uh, skin in the game the borrower really has. And then just like real estate, there's a lot of other types of asset classes for notes, niches that you can kind of go into. So there's commercial, there's multifamily, there's uh, even unsecured stuff like credit cards, um, auto loans, which are secured by the actual uh, car or the, the auto itself. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of go into this industry. But for the purposes of what we're talking about and what I focus on in our business is we buy loans on residential single family homes. So these are not rental properties. These are homes that uh, individuals and their families live in and they have lived in for maybe decades. Uh, so just a brief primer on where, you know, how do notes get created? How do they, you know, how do they come into the marketplace or come into being? The first most obvious is banks. So banks, credit unions, large institutions, they originate secured mortgages. And uh, some of those could be Fannie Mae, Freddie type of uh, government securitized mortgages that are government backed. Some might not be. Um, banks are probably one of the largest originators of mortgages. So we actually buy bank originated mortgages and it comes through to the secondary market. It's kind of a, a long story on how that happens, but you can buy them. Um, the second way that notes are created are from individuals. So you might have someone who owns a house and maybe they're nearing retirement age and they don't want to sell the house for cash, maybe because of 
uh, tax consequences or other things. Maybe they just want an income stream. And so what they would do is uh, they would sell me a house, let's say, and I would, I would pay them um, a multi-payment. They would create a note and a mortgage on that. And it's really just called uh, a seller carryback or kind of uh, like lender financing. You hear that a lot. So there's a huge market for that. Um, and then the other way of, you know, where notes are created in the marketplace is what's known as private lending. And private lending, sometimes it's called hard money. Usually when, when investors are talking about private lending, it's a shorter term. So it's not going to be that traditional 30 year fixed kind of loan that you're thinking of at four or 5%. It's going to be a short term, maybe six, 24 months, three years max. And it's usually used for like rehab work. If you're fixing and flipping a property or, um, you know, as a, almost like a bridge loan to get to where you're going to exit the deal. And with that type of note and mortgage, you are looking at um, rates that are a lot higher. Usually it could be anywhere from eight to maybe 14%, depending on the deal, but they're much shorter term. And so you're in and out of deals, you know, every six months or every year or so. And, and those, we don't focus on so much, mostly for the fact that you have to go in and every six months you have to find another deal, right? So it's work. And we're, as, um, as Quest investors, we basically want to put something in the account and just kind of forget about it, monitor it. You don't want to have to go out and find that new deal all the time. So here's some, here's some, um, some topics on why notes, we believe notes are a superior investment. So with notes, it's a little bit different than real estate because you have real safety and control. Uh, you don't own the property, but it's secured by the property. So the loan is secured. Uh, when you buy a loan, typically you're gonna buy it at a discount. And what a discount means is, let's say the borrower owes $100,000 and it's secured by this property. Well, a seller, uh, is going to sell that at a discount for a number of reasons. And a discount could be where the borrower owes hundred grand. We might buy that performing loan for 70. And so you have a $30,000 spread in there. And what happens is um, that adds to your yield. When you calculate that correctly, that adds to your profit. And if the borrower ends up paying off early, that 30,000 is actually just gravy for your account. Um, so the discount part of it is really a magical part of buying notes on the secondary market. And notes are largely passive. Now I say largely because it's not 100%, um, depending on how large of a portfolio you have, the quality of the notes, there could be some you know, effort on your part, meaning uh, talking with servicers, uh, kind of keeping borrowers paying, working with attorneys if needed. So there is some effort that's needed if you have more than just a handful of notes. Uh, but for the most part, compared to real estate, notes are completely passive or very close to completely passive in the fact that you buy them, you, they're performing, you put them in your IRA, you have a licensed servicer that collects the funds, and then it just comes back into your account every month. So very low hassle. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about is you are involved in real estate without a lot of the hassles. So you don't have property tax, you don't have insurance, you don't have uh, repairs, you don't have to uh, do turnover every time you have a new tenant. There's a lot of different things that you kind of wash your hands of when you have a note. Uh, of course, there are other issues to be aware of, and we'll go through that a little bit later here, just to talk on some of the, the things to be aware of. Because um, no investment's perfect. There's, there's certainly things you need to be aware of. And then for most investors, the, the passive investor, uh, the Quest investor who wants to put uh, buy notes or buy shares of a note fund or something like that, where they just kind of want to know that they have some security, they want to understand what the investment is and then set it and pretty much forget it. So the opportunity for most people, including what we do, is we buy performing or very solid re-performing notes with criteria that has equity. So equity is going to be the fair market value of the property 
minus any loans that are on the property or against the property. So if it's a first or second or whatnot, um, you want a significant amount of equity. You want something that you feel comfortable if you buy this and for some reason the borrower falls off the horse or loses their job or can't recover and can't pay you, you have some recourse to go recover your funds. And that's what equity does for you. Uh, you wanna have a strong verifiable payment history. And so payment history is gonna be retrieved from the servicer, which we'll talk about later. But really you just wanna see that this borrower has not just started this loan, but has either put a large down payment if they have, if it's modified or a new loan, or uh, just a long string of payment history, a year or more is what you wanna see. And then you wanna buy them at a discount. Like we talked about, there's a big advantage to doing that uh, when you can negotiate the deal correctly because you can buy something for less than is owed. So occasionally you will have payoffs where you do make that extra 30 grand, like I mentioned uh, in the one example. It doesn't happen all the time. You can't force them. It'd be nice if you could. Uh, it just doesn't happen that way. And uh, one of the things that really, really is nice about notes is it helps you diversify. So you don't have to put everything in one deal. You don't have to spend $200,000 on one or two notes. Um, you can really diversify, buy notes, 20, 30, $50,000 at a pop and spread your risk. So they're secured on real estate, but you're also spreading your risk between borrowers. So it's a really nice way to do that. Um, you can do that yourself inside your Quest account by just buying uh, assets or notes titled to your Quest account individually. Or you could also further diversify into a note fund, which essentially pools your investment over hundreds of notes. And then finally, um, one of the best things about notes is to reinvest your earnings as quickly as possible to compound your yield. So the faster you get that money back into your account, and the more you can build up a lump sum to immediately go out and buy another one, um, that's where you're going to see that compounding take effect. So one of my favorite things about notes really is the amortization. And uh, I really like numbers. It's just kind of my thing. And um, I think a lot of people don't really understand how amortization works. Even if you have a mortgage on your house, amortization is one of the most powerful things in this investment. And it, it's really how you make money with any type of lending. So for this example, uh, what I did was this is an actual loan that we purchased uh, in our portfolio for our performing fund. And what this, the left side here is, this whole thing is the borrower's amortization. The left side is uh, what the borrower owes. Okay, so at the top you have, they're paying 8% interest. They owe 73,000 and change. Their monthly payment is 795.04, and they have approximately 144 payments left. Now, that 144 payments, they could pay it off anytime. There's no uh, prepayment penalty or anything like that. We're just assuming, you know, if everything stays the same and you're going into this, they're going to make every payment and just pay it to term. So that's how you have to look at these investments. Never assume that, you know, they're going to pay early because you just don't know. It's kind of random in that sense. So on this side, you see, you know, this person is going to be making payments at the end of the first year, he will have paid, he or she will have paid 87,000 and change. I'm sorry, 8,700 and change. And then the interest portion of that is about 5,200 and change, right? So you can see the first year kind of project what your account's going to collect. And then at the end here, you can see this would be at the end of his full term. Right, so you're looking at the 144 payment. So this is years out, of course. The total amount collected, 114,000, and then you have the interest broke down, and then the principal. And so you can kind of see how this thing um, just leaks money over time as this as this borrower pays it down. And so this is very advantageous to putting into an account and letting it do its thing and then reinvesting those earnings. So on the next page here, it looks very similar, but this is the buyer's amortization. So this would be not what the borrower is paying, but what our, uh, you know, the funds yield and um, 
profit would look like. And so on here, you have, you know, we purchased it at a discount. And so the funds spent was just over 55,000. So that's out, our out of pocket purchase for this asset. And you can see because there was a difference between, I'm gonna go back on the slide here, 73,000 right here, what the borrower owes versus what we paid, the 55, there's a difference there. And we use some software, uh, it's called T-Value or Time Value. I, it's very inexpensive, it's excellent software, mortgage software. Um, you can just search T-Value online and find it, I would recommend it. Um, but it produces these beautiful amortization schedules and helps you make decisions. And so on here, you can see that even though the borrower is paying 8%, we're actually earning 14. And so there's, it's very powerful to be able to purchase things like this in your IRA. So same kind of thing here. We're looking at, you know, interest. The interest that we're receiving is different based on what we pay. So a certain because we paid less, we're actually receiving a higher yield on this, this asset. And then over here on the right hand side, you can see that uh, essentially, we've got the same payment breakdown. The borrower is still paying the same 114,000, but the the amount that you're pocketing and your out of pocket initial basis is different. So that that kind of spread is where the magic happens on amortization, because you're buying something at a discount that's amortizing over time. Um, one of the things that can be very powerful with this, like I said, is compounding. You have a couple of these in your account, you let them compound to where you have a lump sum and you go out and you buy another one and it starts to snowball over time. Another technique that you could do with something like this is as you're getting payments, you could actually use the interest portion. Let's say you have residential real estate, some rental real estate that you plan on paying off and owning outright, you know, at the, uh, when you retire, maybe it's years, decades away. Um, you could be making your normal mortgage payments to that and then using the extra interest that this thing produces to pay down that mortgage. And you still have not lost your principal that you put in here. You're using this borrower's interest literally to pay down your other assets. So there's a lot of ways you can use this to pay down loans, school loans, um, you know, eventually own properties outright, all kinds of things. And so the amortization is really where the magic happens when you're buying these. And part of, um, part of the due diligence is once you've passed a lot of the due diligence checklists, you're looking at this saying, is this worth going into this, this purchase, this asset? Uh, again, like I said, predictability and really the consistency is what you're looking for. And it might not be that exciting. It might not be in the teens. As far as a return, it might be 8%, 10%. But if it's steady and you don't have to mess with it, you don't have to uh, you know, spend extra funds maintaining it, you don't have to worry about it, average and steady is much, much better long-term, uh, as provided it's a good asset and has equity. So this is just a really quick chart showing that if you have 8.5% interest and you're compounding that annually, what that kind of looks like with an initial $100,000 investment. So this could be over, you know, over a couple loans that you purchase, maybe 50 grand each. Maybe this is in a note fund that owns 200 loans. Doesn't matter, the, the principle is the same. And you can see over time that it starts to, it starts very slowly at first, but as you're compounding, it starts to really take off. And this is the type of power that you can do with notes because it's that cash flow component, you're getting it back monthly. And as soon as you get it back, if you can reinvest it as soon as possible, that's really the key. So that all sounds really good, but you know, what does it look like in real life? So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what a note transaction looks like. We've done hundreds of these and just kind of walk you through step-by-step -step at a, a very basic level, what it looks like. So on the left-hand side here, what you do, in the middle, what the seller does, and then what the servicer does. So there's three parties in here that are gonna take three specific actions. 
So starting on the left, what you do, first of all, you have to find the notes to buy. And sometimes that's the hardest part is finding uh, suitable assets to purchase that are um, you know, in your price range, in the quality that you want, they're not beat up or non-paying. Um, so that's really the biggest challenge. Uh, how you do that is developing relationships and talking to people and just getting out there, talking to brokers, et cetera. The second step here is performing your initial due diligence. So the biggest thing on this asset class, I'd say 80% of the heavy lifting is really the due diligence. And the due diligence is we have a complete checklist for that type of process. But the initial due diligence, if um, someone came to me and said, hey, I have a loan to sell, what I do is I immediately I look at it. They're going to give us probably like a tape, which is just an Excel spreadsheet of the, the information on the loan. And we're going to look at that and say, you know, is this even remotely what we're interested in? If it is, what we'll do is we'll do some initial due diligence. We'll look at the property. We'll look at um, several other different things, and then we'll make an offer. So the offer is subject to what's called its indicative offer. And it's subject to the remainder of our due diligence. So what it's saying to the seller is, hey, I like this. I can offer you this. The seller says, that's great. Okay, I can pay you, but we have to complete the remainder of the due diligence and it has to check out. So that's all that's saying. So you're agreeing upon price, then you complete the remainder of the due diligence. And we'll talk a little bit more in an upcoming slide about some of the due diligence items. Um, so I'm just kind of glossing over it here. Then the next step, you're going to sign the purchase and sale agreement. This is going to outline what you're purchasing, the unpaid balance of the loan, uh, where it's located, who the buyer and seller are, what the purchase price is, et cetera. Uh, then you're going to complete your investment form that's required by Quest. So Quest has a specific form that they're going to need you to complete in order to make a transaction. And it doesn't matter if you're buying a individual loan for your Quest account or if you're buying shares in a note fund, it's the same thing, same idea. Uh, so once you have that and you've filled it out, you're gonna submit this PSA or the purchase and sale agreement and the forms that Quest requires to Quest for funding. And then they're gonna review it and say yes or no or make revisions. Then Quest sends the seller the funds to complete the purchase. So whether again, whether that's an individual seller or a fund, they're gonna send the IRA funds to make the investment. And then you uh, or your representative, usually you, are going to send the seller, whoever's selling the loan, service transfer info. Now, what is that? Service transfer info is um, typically you need a servicer, a licensed servicer, to send out statements to the borrower, collect payments from the borrower, things like that. They're your face to the borrower, so you're not doing this yourself. So you're going to need to tell the seller, where do I want this thing serviced? You might be able to leave it where it's at, if it's at a servicer you want, or you can move it to another servicer, and that's called a service transfer. So the seller needs to know, what do you want me to do with it now that it's yours? And then what the seller's job is, is to confirm receipt of the funds. So once they receive funds, they should reach out to you immediately and say, hey, we received the funds, thank you for the transaction, Here's the next steps, et cetera. And then the next part from the seller is they need to create an assignment and it'll launch. And what that is, is it's just ownership. It's transfer of ownership of the deed of trust or the, the mortgage, depending on the state, and the note. So the assignment is for the deed of trust or mortgage and the allonge is transferring ownership of the note. So remember we have those two separate documents. So they're gonna transfer it from the seller's name, who was the owner, to your Quest account, who is now the new owner. And then they're going to record that at the county. Um, and then they're going to transfer servicing to your servicer of choice. And then they're going to forward any funds from that they received from the borrower to the new servicer. So they might have funds that are held in suspense or uh, in a holding account that were maybe half a payment they couldn't apply or something like that they're going to forward that to the new servicer for the benefit of your account. And then what the servicer does is they accept service transfer of the loan. And if it's, if you're keeping it at the same servicer that the seller had it at, 
you're just basically switching accounts into your Quest Trust account so they can they know who the new owner is. If it's not, you might be sending it to another different servicer, and there's a bunch of forms and other items that you need to fill out in order to, to effectuate that transfer. So the servicer, depending on the type of transfer, if it's external to a new servicer or if it's internal to the same servicer, just different lender account, uh, they're going to send out to the borrower, there's very specific disclosures, they're going to send out the borrower uh, hello or goodbye letters, they're called, saying, hey, send your payments here or you know, send your payments there, or what's known as a TILA letter, truth and lending letter. And then the servicer is going to just keep moving forward and sending the borrower account statements every month, just like you would get with your mortgage. So you know what to pay, who to pay it to, what the balance is, et cetera. And the servicer is gonna give you access to their online portal to view the account. So you should be able to log in, kind of see what's going on, or at the very least log into your Quest account and see, you know, hey, when did I receive these payments from the borrower? When's the next one due, et cetera. And then the servicer, really, their job is to accept payments from the borrower each month on your behalf. And then they're going to deposit maybe once or twice a month those funds to you or your Quest account. Um, and so that's really kind of the, the nuts and bolts of a, a general note transaction, like a performing note, what the steps that you would need to go through to locate you know, come to an agreement, purchase, and then, and then close the deal. And then one of the things I think is really important to talk about is due diligence. So all of this sounds really great, but with every investment, any type of investment, there's always dangers. There's always things to burn you, to lose money on. You certainly can lose money. Um, in fact, if you're not educated, it's very easy to. And so I'm just going to cover a few specific items that hopefully will be helpful for you during your due diligence of a note. Um, and we'll go from left to right here. So on the left, we've got property specific items. In the middle, we have note and mortgage specific items. And then on the right, we have servicing specific items. So on the left, property specific items, fair market value. You wanna use multiple sources. You wanna figure out what is the actual house worth. Um, and just speaking from experience, uh, in general, we recommend that we don't buy anything that is on a house that's lower than, let's call it 150 grand. So a house that's worth less than $150,000, in general, you have a different type of borrower, you have a different neighborhood, you have all kinds of things that are not necessarily in your favor. And I'm not saying you can't make money, it's just something that we've kind of come to a realization over time that we want higher value properties. And so we're looking for the fair market value for this asset to be 150 grand or up. And it depends on where you live. If you're living in California or somewhere where the average house is $700,000, obviously a buck 50 is a, a chicken coop. So you need to kind of adjust that accordingly. Um, a BPO, it, you can always get a BPO, which stands for broker price opinion. And that's essentially the best you can do outside of, um, you know, an actual interior inspection. You don't own the property, the borrower does. And so you can do a BPO, which is um, like a real estate professional going out to the property, driving around, taking pictures, and then doing comps or comparables saying, hey, we believe based on uh, similar values around the area that's sold, we believe this house is worth X dollars. So that usually costs about $100. You don't have to do it on every deal, um, but it's, it's certainly an option. And then you determine the CLTV equity, which is a combined loan to value. So like we talked about, fair market value minus all the other liens on the property. And then uh, I strongly recommend having an attorney pull and review title. So what you're gonna do with that is this is after you have come to an agreement with purchase price with the seller. So you don't want to be spending all this money if you know, you're just kicking the tires and the seller's kind of iffy. You want to have some sort of agreement already in place, at least verbally or on in email. And you're going to pull title. And the attorney is going to review it to make sure that you have clean title, that the, the note and mortgage is valid, that all those things that you have the correct owner um, 
those things are important because if you ever have a dispute with the borrower or if you ever have to enforce the lien or foreclose, which normally you don't, I mean, it's very rare, but if you do, you wanna make sure that you have that in place. And then uh, moving to the center here, the note and mortgage specific items, you wanna review the note. You wanna review the terms, the rate, the payment, the maturity. You wanna make sure that all the information that the seller has given you is exactly what the borrower has agreed to and signed. That's really important because that's what you're buying ultimately. Um, if the loan has been modified, uh, we have another fund that does a lot of modifications. So we very familiar with this and how they work. Um, modification terms need to be very clear. It's essentially a modified note uh, with new terms. And so you need to read that and understand what's been agreed to by the lender and the borrower. And then the payment status, you want to know how long has this person been paying? You want to get a pay history from the servicer. Is it uh, really spotty? Do they miss three months and then catch up or have they just paid on time like clockwork for years? And that's really the borrower that you want. And then depending on the loan and depending on what you're doing, you can pull credit. Um, you need to be cautious with that. You need to get some approvals either from the seller or from the borrower. Uh, I wouldn't recommend just pulling it randomly. Um, but credit really just tells you kind of what's going on with this borrower, how their spending and debt habits are. And then Pacer. Pacer is an online portal that's open to anyone. Uh, you have to sign up for an account, but really what it is, is it just shows any kind of um, bankruptcy history. So you want to know if your borrower is currently in bankruptcy, because that's a big deal, or if they have filed bankruptcy a number of times. Now, a lot of people have filed bankruptcy in the past, and that's okay. But if you see someone who has repeatedly, you know, every chance they get, every couple of years, they're filing a BK, this person is not the borrower that you want. Doesn't matter what the equity is. It doesn't matter how good the deal is. It's just not worth it because they're going to do it again. And then the outstanding UPB, which stands for unpaid balance, which is really what you are buying. The uh, UPB is the total outstanding balance of the loan at the time of purchase. So that's, you want to verify that uh, with the servicer and make sure that that is on file with them. So you, you guys are on the same page of what's being purchased. And then uh, servicing specific items, I would request a copy of the payoff from the servicer. So if we were going to pay the loan off, what's owed? Uh, that should be very easy to get. And then I would review the payoff for accuracy against the note and mortgage or against what the uh, seller has provided you. You know, do they match? Are they way off? Because uh, sometimes sellers don't know. If they have a number of loans, they just may not have paid attention. And so it's your job to, to really dig deep and figure out um, what this looks like. And then you're going to review servicing comments. So servicers keep a record, a running log of every call in, email, comment, sneeze, anything that happens um, with uh, the borrower account. And so they log it. And so you can request that from your seller and say, hey, give me a copy of, uh, of everything they have. And that will often provide a window into what type of borrower this is. So these are, these are really important items before you pull the trigger on something to determine, you know, what, what am I walking into or what is my risk profile on something like this? And this is something that we do every day and it's become second nature, but for someone starting out, it's very important to be cautious with this kind of thing and don't be afraid of it, but just understand that there are risks to it and just adjust accordingly. And then we get a lot of questions, Jane and I, about, you know, what's the difference of using my IRA to uh, buy individual notes for myself, like we've talked about, or buy um, maybe a percentage or an ownership in a fund. So what is a fund? A, a note fund really is just an LLC, a specific private entity that's set up and brings in cash from investors and issues shares, ownership shares to investors. So owners, uh, investors are owners, they're passive owners with no day-to-day -day responsibility. And then the fund goes out and buys these performing loans and then aggregates them under the fund name and under the fund bank accounts and then distributes profits to investors that way. So investors buying a share of a fund would be like 
um, kind of like a stock almost where you're participating in the whole of the company, the whole performance of all the loans instead of maybe one or two. So the advantages, there's really not a right answer to either of these. Um, buying a whole note does have advantages. You can hand select the loan you want. So you can go and say, hey, I want a note here and spend the time and effort to do that. Uh, you do participate in early payoffs. So if you're buying it at a discount, you can participate if there is an early payoff and it's rare, but it, they do happen. Um, you know, your account would benefit from that. Buying a whole note is more of a hands-on learning experience because you're going to need to do all the due diligence. You're going to need to make sure that you're making a good purchase in your Quest account prior to pulling the trigger. Uh, the disadvantages of buying a whole note is really if the borrower ever defaults, and it's unlikely. Um, it, it's rare, but it could happen. It could be the one that does. Uh, you know, you'll have to get with the servicer, have them help you coordinate the foreclosure, hire an attorney, pay the attorney. Um, it could get expensive. Usually foreclosures are anywhere from three to $7,000, depending on the state. Uh, and you could have significant money tied into one asset unless you split the money up into multiple. So really the disadvantage is there might be a little bit more legwork. It's just hard to tell, uh, but you do have upside. Uh, if you invest in a fund, and there's a lot of them out there, and we manage a couple, but there's tons of others uh, very similar to ours, uh, you really have diversification is the advantage because you are an owner and you're owning all of it. So you, if the fund owns 50 or 200 notes, you're participating in the strength of all of that instead of one or two that might you know, flop or kind of go south. Um, so there's a, a significant advantage to that. You don't need to monitor or have any kind of hands-on day-to-day stuff. Typically the principals will handle that. We'll have staff to handle that. Um, so it really is much more hands-free. Uh, usually these types of entities will have better pricing. So they'll have better sourcing of product. So I can say for with certainty that we have relationships that we can get much better deals than the average person because we've developed those relationships and taken the time years to you know, buy millions of dollars worth of assets from some of these other entities. And so it's easier for us to, or other firms to get better deals. Uh, the return is usually on par that with notes that you would buy yourself. So it's gonna depend a little bit on how uh, well you can source individual loans for yourself. I mean, if you have a great source and you just, you know, you're off and running already, that might be the best way to go. It's hard to say. The disadvantages of a note fund really to me is you don't get to hand pick each note. So you're gonna have an entire portfolio of notes. You don't get to hand pick them. The manager's picking them. Um, and you don't actively manage the assets. So this is not for someone who wants to get in and get their hands dirty and, and see the email communication between borrowers and all that stuff. You don't get that with a fund. Uh, it's just more of a hands-free, check your account, make sure I'm getting paid every month or every quarter, uh, and that's it. So that's really the, two, the difference between the two. And there's not a right answer. It just depends on the investor, what's, what's important to you. And... Uh, just to start to wrap this up, really to purchase notes inside a Quest account, you're gonna complete the normal process. You're gonna sign the purchase and sale agreement or the fund documents, whatever that is. It's gonna be titled in your IRA name. So it's not gonna be in your name personally. You're never gonna to touch the money yourself. And you're gonna sign it as read and approved by your name. And then you're gonna give all those documents to Quest along with the funding instructions. Quest is going to do their thing and go through and review, make any changes, make any recommendations, reach out to um, you for anything else they might need. And then you're just going to close the transaction. They're going to fund it. The only other thing that uh, to be aware of is that you will have fair market valuations. And so Quest will reach out and say, hey, what's the value of this asset or your shares in this company, et cetera. And that's something that you can just either fill out yourself or um, if it is a fund, you give it to the fund managers and they'll fill that out and give it to Quest on your behalf. 
Um, one thing question that we get a lot with regards to notes is uh, UBIT or unrelated business taxable income. So it's going to depend. This is something I would suggest talking to your CPA and also Quest about prior to a purchase. Um, for the most part, when you're buying notes or when you're buying or investing in a fund, you're not going to have that because you're not using leverage. You're not um, borrowing money like you would if you had a mortgage and you're buying rental property. So you're just using cash to buy a discounted note. So you're not going to have that UBIT typically. But again, I'm not a CPA, so that's something you're going to need to check on prior to any type of investment. And then uh, one last thing I wanted to share with you um, an offer that I'd like to extend. And uh, this is a book that I wrote in 2017. It's called Paper Profits. And uh, essentially what it is, is an informational book. There's no selling or anything in it. It's just information on the note business and some of the items that we talked about here, but in much more detail. And we'd be happy, our staff would be happy to ship this out to you. If you'd like to go to the link that's, uh, that's here on the slide to our website, just fill out some information. It's a physical book, so we will ship that to you. And then uh, if you have any questions on it, just, just let us know, we're happy to talk with you. And then finally, here's our contact information. So we've got uh, our website, both of us here, email, and then uh, cell phones as well. So that wraps up my presentation. Um, I'm happy to talk about uh, any kind of questions or anything you guys would like to talk about. Oh yes, we definitely have some questions. So guys, if you have questions for Josh, be sure to send them to the Q&A box. Uh, but let's kind of go ahead and go right through them. We've got some good ones here. Um, this one kind of came in towards the beginning of the presentation, and this attendee wants to know, what exits do you propose in case of high inflation or hyperinflation? Example, maybe like 10% a year or more. That's a really good question. That's something I've put a lot of thought into in the past six months. And I think that is probably one of the... Um, one of the negatives of, of notes is that you know, they're fixed rate, they're fixed rate in dollars. And if there is inflation, inflation goes up, making things more expensive. And so basically, strictly speaking, that income stream that you're getting is worth less over time. So a way to protect yourself with that uh, would be if you have a portfolio or if you're, you know, shares in a fund or whatever, um, is to have smaller term uh, exposure, meaning don't have all your loans as a 30 year fixed, maybe have it to where you can get in and out two or three years, five years max, to where you're not exposed for extreme periods of time, which would um, you know, have inflation take the most toll. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where I think that the, the, the real answer to a lot of investors would be to balance that with things that are gonna keep pace with inflation if, that's, if that were to happen. So things like rental real estate, um, tangible hard goods that are going to go up in value. It doesn't matter if the dollar goes away, there's going to be some form of trading in there, whether it's the euro or jelly beans or whatever, it's going to be something that, you know, you're still going to get an income stream from. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great point to make there. And it kind of leads right into one of the questions that I had. Um, whenever you're purchasing existing notes, do you prefer to buy new notes or notes that have been existing for two to three years? Is there like a, a parameter there of, you know, the length of the note that, you know, or that it's existed that you look for whenever you're buying? Yeah. So we're looking, um, you know, we buy freshly originated or even modified loans. Uh, and we also buy loans that have been performing for years. So I don't think there's a criteria for time frame. What we are looking at is um, equity, fair market value, making sure there's plenty of equity to protect us. And if it is a fresh loan, let's say it was newly originated, newly modified, whatever, um, down payment's a big deal. Uh, so somebody that's put $1,000 down versus someone that's put $30,000 down, you know, the 30 grand person's not gonna walk if something gets tough. They're gonna figure out a way to work it out. Um, the thousand dollar person, you know, there's just less skin in the game. So we will buy both, but we analyze what our risk profile is for the fund based on, um, 
you know, those criteria, equity, payment history, and then down payment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Interesting. Um, so next question here, for those of us with small IRAs, are we able to begin these types of investments at $1,000 or is it best to increase the account first? What's your take on that? Uh, it depends. So, I mean, you can find, personally, if it was me, I would, I would increase the account first. Um, and the reason for that is $1,000 is, you know, a couple grand is gonna be too low to find a decent note. Um, and if you do find a decent note, it's going to be very, the monthly payment is going to be tiny. It's going to be like $45 right, or 50 bucks. So it's not going to be exciting for you. It's going to take forever. You like feel like you're getting anywhere. Um, and then funds typically will want, you know, more money than that to participate just to make it worth the time and effort to set up accounts and do all that stuff. So if it was me, I would do my best to just build it up a little bit more and then make your first purchase mm-hmm. or combine accounts to make a purchase if you have that. Yes. Yeah. That's a great point. And Hey, if you've only got a thousand dollars in your IRA, I would definitely recommend look into making your annual contribution because not only can you do that for this year, but you can still contribute for 2020 as well. Got to find a way to always sneak that in there. Um, but speaking of, you know, a minimum to invest into a fund, we've actually had several people ask, is there a minimum to invest into a fund? What would I typically be looking at there? You know, it depends. Every offering is different um, and they're all over the map. I mean, what, what we see most frequently is somewhere around 50,000. Um, it's Sometimes it can be lower, you know, 35, 40, uh, but that's kind of the range that a lot of funds are going to be looking for for participation. Um, some will accept like multiple accounts, like I said, where, hey, I've got my account, my wife's account, and those both equal this. And that's acceptable too a lot of times, but um, yeah, it's kind of all over the map. But in general, I would say around 40 to 50 grand. Mm -hmm. Nice. And typically for these note funds, do you have to be accredited to invest? Does it depend on how they have the funds set up? It's usually the next question that always comes in after that. (laughs) Yeah. So it depends on how the fund is set up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Awesome. Um, Let's see. This is a good one. You mentioned diversification in shorter terms. Can one invest $30,000 and exit in less than five years? Is this possible? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can certainly do that. There's a couple ways to do it. Um, so you can invest 30 grand and, um, you know, buy a performing note, hope that it pays off in five years, which is kind of a wish. Uh, or you could buy it at a good purchase price yield discount. So you got a decent deal on it hold it for five years while you're receiving those payments and then sell it for a profit. So -hmm. it's going to depend a little bit on um, where that loan is on the amortization cycle earlier, the better, because you're the first few years of payments are all interest. So you can almost, you know, if it's a newer loan, you could almost buy that thing and sit on it for five years and sell it for almost the same price if you're savvy with it. So you could do that. Um, another way would be to buy into a fund with a limited time frame. Say, hey, I'm going to be in for two or three or five years and then exit after that time. Mm-hmm. Nice. Very interesting. Um, this is a good question. Is there a network of reputable servicing companies that we can tap into in case the person that we're buying the note from does not have one? Yes, absolutely. I can make a recommendation right here. Um, we have tried a lot of them and I think servicers are really underappreciated because a lot of the hoops that they have to jump through and regulatory things they do for us as lenders. So you're never going to find one, at least in my experience, that you're 100% happy with. What what I would recommend for most investors is uh, we use a company called FCI Lender Services, and they do a, a wonderful job. Uh, they have a wonderful portal that you can log in online and view your account. They're very responsive. They're super professional. Um, I would recommend them almost to anybody. Yeah, FCI Lender Services. Perfect. And for all of our attendees out there, I did stick that in the chat for you. And I've actually, you know, I haven't, you know, bought a note myself yet. It's definitely in the cards, but almost every note speaker that we have on our events mentions FCI. I feel They're like. Great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're very good. Awesome. All right. Just a few more questions here. Um, One of our attendees wants to know, 
what is the typical return or yield for a new note investor buying individual or groups of notes? How does this compare with the annual return um, in a note fund, you know, just in the, these recent years? So it depends. <laughs> um, you know, it depends on how new and it depends if you are able to get in touch with the right sellers and develop relationships. I, I think that's really the hardest part when people come into this business is finding deals, right? Finding enough good deals that aren't junk to make bids on because a lot of your bids aren't going to be accepted. It's kind of a numbers thing. Um, but in general, very general terms, uh, you know, the yield is going to be, I mean, anywhere from maybe 8% to 12% on the high end. You can get much higher. You can get into the teens, but I think you need to be a little bit more savvy. That's really probably not a, a beginning investor. Um, you know, 8 to 10% is kind of, I mean, realistically, if you're just coming into this with no experience is really what you're going to expect. Probably. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, let's see. So that's all of our questions from our attendees. I actually wrote down a few myself. Um, what are some common hangups that you see when new investors are buying notes? What are some common hangups maybe that, you know, they might encounter? Do you have any words of advice there just for our attendees who might be looking to get into notes maybe for the first time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, some of the common hangups I would say for, that I've seen a lot from people who haven't purchased this asset class is they will look for it. They will try to find something that's in their neighborhood. They'll try to find something that's in their town. That's like they can walk to and drive by. And this kind of business is really not built for that. I mean, you can, there, I, we've purchased notes, you know, here in Austin in my hometown and it was just random. It wasn't the, you know, we were looking for them. Uh, depending on where you live, it could be very difficult to find notes on properties that you can buy in your price range at the type of house you want, et cetera. So I would say, don't worry about where it's at so much. Worry about the quality of the neighborhood, the quality of the property, the fair market value, the quality of the note and farm over. Um, focus on those things. You don't need to go see the property. You can do all that online. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, don't analyze things to death. You do need to do due diligence quite a bit, but don't, you don't need a year to do it. Uh, what you need to do is figure out the basics, practice a few times. And then what I did when I started was I had, I paid a guy to mentor me uh, to buy my first couple notes because I was really timid about it. And I said, well, I don't want to lose my money. You know, it's in my IRA. Um, so I, I paid him to walk me through the process of how do I fill out the forms and do all that. And, yeah, it costs money, but I didn't lose any money either. And I felt much more secure about it. And so if I was worried about that, I would, I would find somebody to help me walk through it. Yeah. I think that's such great advice there, especially for all of our investors out there that might be newer, you know, maybe doing your first couple of deals, link up with people that have been in the business, you know, obviously do your research and due diligence, but it's so important to make those connections with others that have done this before. And come into that relationship, add value, you know, have, you know, a good sense of ethics amongst yourself. And there's a lot of ways that you can be successful by teaming up with people that have maybe done it a few times before, which is why we love to bring you guys out to our events. Yeah. Um, I just have one or two more questions. Um, let's see here. Do you guys purchase partials or do you just do? Uh, we sell partials. We, we haven't purchased partials for a long time. Um, I've created partials and sold them. They're wonderful. Yeah, we could do a whole a whole uh, topic on partials. They're they're pretty interesting. Yeah, they gosh, that racks my brain a little bit. Um, you said something earlier whenever you were talking about the process of buying a note that I thought was interesting. The indicative offer, where it's your offer, but you still have due diligence to do. Is that in writing? Is that in a certain type of contract? How does that work? So really, um, a lot of times. It's, it's not in writing. Usually it's either verbally or through email. And the reason for it is a lot of times you'll get sellers or potential sellers giving you uh, an Excel spreadsheet or a tape, really, what they call it, of notes. Hey, I want to sell these. Okay, great. Well, you don't want to spend a lot of time and effort ordering a BPO or a title. Like They start to get expensive if you don't have an agreement in place or some sort of 
you know, yeah, I'm willing to sell it for this price. Uh, so usually what we just do is we'll ask, we'll do a very uh, cursory view of it. And like, yes, I would buy it for this price based on me completing the remainder of the due diligence. And then I just tell the seller that. And if they say yes, then okay, great. Usually it's through email. I mean, for the most part, email, text, um, it, it's pretty rare that you can meet somebody like that in person. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe at an event, industry event or something, but it's usually through email. And if it's agreed, that's good enough for us to spend, you know, a few hundred bucks to do the due diligence. Mm-hmm. Nice. Interesting. So it's not like you get a house under contract and then you have your option period. It's before it's actually. Uh, under- yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit different from like a normal home transaction or real estate transaction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Which kind of leads me right into the last question that I have from one of our attendees. Um, when someone's purchasing a note, what purchase and sale agreement do you use? Is there like a set contract to use? Um, how does that process actually work? Yeah. So uh, we have one that we've used for several years that we've kind of settled on. I've seen dozens of different versions. I don't think there's like a standard purchase and sale like there would be for real estate, maybe like a realtor's, you know, Texas purchase yeah. and sale agreement. There's not anything like that. Um, really what you're looking for in a purchase and sale is outline the, the buyer and seller, what's being sold, you know, that they're going to transfer servicing to you, that they're going to create the assignments and just all the little things that kind of cover you in case maybe they get a payment after you, you bought the loan and it's in the middle of the transfer and they receive a big payment for the borrower or payoff. Like that needs to be outlined in the agreement because it's your money. You just bought the loan. Um, so there's a variety of things in there that, uh, that need to, to be covered, but it's really not, it's not complicated by any means. I mean, if you read it a few times, it's pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. Nice. And one of our attendees is asking, you mentioned having a mentor for your first couple of note deals. Do you have a mentor that you could recommend? Do you have any kind of pointers there for some of our attendees that are asking about that? It's a good question. I don't right now. Um, you know, in the past, there was several people, colleagues of mine that uh, had some mentorship programs and things like that. I mean, they're paid. That's that's something you're not really going to get around. But, um, you know, we don't do mentoring just because we don't have the bandwidth for that right now. But you're all you're always welcome to message us or, you know, set up a, a short call or something with myself or Jane. We'd be happy to, to answer questions. Um, it would be full blown handholding, but you know, you could continue the conversation to kind of point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And I think that's a great point to end on there. Um, Guys, as you can see, we still have all of Josh's contact information on the screen, as well as Jane. Um, Jane helps with so much. She helps all the coordination for you speaking on our events. Um, She's been great to work with there. So Josh, before we wrap it up for the day, do you have any last kind of um, words or piece of advice for our attendees before we sign off for the day? I would say if it's something that's of interest to you, study, read to where you feel you have a basic understanding. You don't have to be an expert and then take action and just make it a small action to where you're not going to lose, you know, don't bet the farm on it uh, or get qualified professional people to help you and you'll be fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And guys, be sure to check out that link that I did put there in the chat. If you go to that link, it's the paperprofitsinvestors.com slash get the book too. There's some dashes in there. Y'all can click the link. It's right there. Um, but be sure to go there and check out Josh's book. It's got a lot of great information in there. And do, don't forget to join us for tomorrow night's virtual networking happy hour that I'll be hosting through Zoom tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. Josh, it's been great to have you back today. I know we just saw each other a few days ago at QuestCon. That was a great event. If you guys missed it out there, you'll definitely have to catch us for the next one. But that's all I've got. I hope y'all have a great day. And Josh, that was a great class. Great information. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Awesome. Y'all have a great day, everyone. Take care.